Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, tonight we have another CD special TVMR, this time with pulmonary critical care with Dr. Bashak, um, Dr. Mack, and also Dr. Robin. And uh, Dr. Bashak, she's a pulmonary critical care um, program director at University of Washington. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Bashak. Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here. We also have Dr. Robin. She's a pulmonary critical care fellowship um, fellow, I'm sorry, uh, at the University of Washington as well. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Robin. Thanks so much for having me. And the last but not the least, Dr. Mack, he's an uh, uh, internal medicine resident, resident to GY3 at the University of Washington as well. Thanks so much for coming, Mack. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'm a PGY2, so got a little bit PGY2. more. PGY2. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just for before starting the case, I would love if Bashak, uh, she could uh, talk a little bit why she chose the monarch critical care as a subspecialty and why she does for fun outside of medicine. Sure. Um, I, I think lots of people have similar reasons for going into pulmonary critical care. I think, number one, I'm an internist at heart, so I really enjoy taking care of a lot of different types of conditions, so I enjoy that about pulmonary and critical care. Um, number two, it is very much a team sport, um, and I am obviously biased, but I think we do multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary care um, in a way that really isn't done in other parts of the, the hospital in the same way. And then finally, I think it is a really big privilege to take care of patients and families um, at a time that's often the worst time of their lives. And I think the way that we take care of them, both medically and how we communicate with them during that time, um, has a lot to you know, shape that experience for them. So it's, it's a big honor and privilege. It certainly is. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ravi? I um, would say that I wanted to pursue pulmonary and critical care for many of the same reasons, in part because I met Bashak when I was a second month intern and the rest is history, um, but similarly enjoy the way in which we get to really comprehensively and holistically think about patients and their, um, the many medical issues that are going on. I think the team aspect of the ICU is incredibly special. Um, it's such a close-knit community, all of the providers, and just like Bashak said, the patients and families too, it's really a special experience. Um, and it has been a pleasure to be in the fellowship program. Amazing, uh, Dr. Mack. Um, I am actually planning on applying into nephrology first. I may do critical care afterwards, but I think similar to um, uh, what Robin was saying, uh, Bashak was uh, uh, someone who I met in medical school and has always been a source of inspiration and I think has kind of opened up my eyes to a lot of the incredible aspects of the ICU and the care that we're able to provide for people. I think it's one of the, it can be one of the most intimidating and scary moments for families and trainees and doctors. Um, but I think like Robin was saying it, uh, and there's so much collaboration and so much teamwork that really it's one of the, I think it's one of the easiest places to like be a vulnerable learner. So I, I just love the ICU. Yeah, the ICU can be frightening <laughs> as well. Um, uh, Bashak, could you please uh, talk a little bit about you did for fun on cyber medicine? Oh, yes, I forgot your, your second part of your question. Um, well, I have a uh, four and a half year old daughter, so she keeps me quite busy outside of medicine. Um, but outside of taking care of her, I really enjoy, um, I enjoy baking. I enjoy cooking Turkish feasts with my husband. We really enjoy cooking for large groups of people and have missed doing that during the pandemic. Um, and 16 years into living in Seattle, we are still exploring the Pacific Northwest and have not completed our list. Amazing. Yeah, the Pacific is so beautiful. Um, a routing, please. Yeah, Seattle is an incredibly beautiful city. Mac has set us up quite well, if you all can look at his uh, background. Um, <laughs> I enjoy certainly being outside. I like to run and explore all the parks in Seattle. Um, it's a unique place that has water and mountains really just at your fingertips. Um, enjoy traveling quite a bit as well. Incredible. I hope you think about Brazil as a next trip. <laughs> and uh, Mac? Um, I think for things that I do um, outside the hospital, the little bit of time that we have, I actually um, am a musician. I play the cello and I love classical music. And so I think one of the things that I've loved about um, uh, society kind of reopening, uh, you know, with all the kind of the things that come with that, the bad and the good is that I've been able to go to symphony concerts with my partner. Um, I also have 
two cats who I'm obsessed about uh, or obsessed with. One is sitting here with me um, in full loaf position. So she's gonna, she's gonna help out today. Incredible, thank you. Uh, and for this session, we couldn't do that without the help of our friends, Deborah and Shema. Deborah, could you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Gebra. I'm from Brazil. I live, um, I'm, I'm in Argentina now. I live here, has seven years and I'm super excited for today. I love pulmonary cases and let's do it. <laughs> Shema. Hi everyone, I'm Shema and I'm a 50 medical student from Germany and outside of medicine, you will find me uh, going to different restaurants and especially going to Korean restaurants. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Shima. Uh, could you please share this screen? And then we can start, Mac, whenever you're ready. Yeah. All right. I'll wait for the screen to come up. All right. So our chief concern is going to be uh, worsening shortness of breath, abdominal and leg swelling. And for our HPI component, uh, this is a 39-year-old woman who reports worsening shortness of breath that has developed over the last few weeks, laying flat and exerting herself exacerbates her shortness of breath. She's also had worsening distension of her abdomen with associated pain, no nausea or vomiting or diarrhea. Um, she also has some lower extremity swelling, um, no chest pain, but she does feel like her heart is racing a lot. Um, no fevers or chills, uh, but she has been having night sweats for some time. Uh, she was recently started on a medication, but can't remember uh, what it's called. Um, and then she has been unable to go to the doctor for the last uh, last few years. Oh, incredible. Thank you, Mac. Uh, Robin, what's going on in your minds when you listen to this piece of information? Yeah, I'm already taking some notes for myself. I have a million thoughts swirling. So we have a young woman who... Mac, you didn't mention, we'll get to this. I'm not sure if she had baseline medical issues or just was living her best healthy life and then started to develop these new symptoms. Um, certainly would be alarming, some leg swelling. Uh, I thought I heard you say no chest pain, but maybe some palpitations or at least increased awareness of her own heart rate. Um, unable to get care recently. Um, so I guess that makes me wonder if things have been going on at more of a subacute time frame and got pushed off or you know, had to, had to wait, um, or maybe just weren't that noticeable at first. Um, and then just as things have become more intense, then, um, the antenna kind of goes up a little bit, uh, higher about maybe seeking some care. Um, and then I heard you say shortness of breath with laying down. So I'm thinking of a variety of organ systems that may be involved. Um, first I'm thinking about her heart. Is this a manifestation of some new heart failure? Um, and that is what is leading to some orthopnea, similarly lower extremity swelling. Um, I also thought to myself about, you know, this is a young woman, um, about some sort of vascular complication. If she's having a, a clot somewhere that has contributed to, um, edema or some of the cardiac symptoms that she's feeling. And then you really, you really hooked me with this, started a new medication, but doesn't know what <laughs> we'll have to dive into that. Um, and importantly, is, does she take other medicines too? Um, I always am wondering about interactions and importantly, another line of questioning, I would go down our um, over-the-counter and supplement type medicines. I've certainly um, been surprised in the past by patients who take things that I A, didn't know exist, B, didn't know how they interacted with other things and um, can, pardon me, can certainly get fooled by that. So um, those are some of my initial thoughts, I guess, rounding out some other organ systems that I may want to inquire about. Um, baseline thyroid disease, this tachycardia maybe could be a manifestation, similarly could, oh, I'm sorry, the, the palpitations rather. Um, and yeah, so in a young woman, that's another thought I might have. Incredible thoughts. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Bashak, uh, anything else to add? No, I um, agree with everything Robin just said, and I'll call out a few things that struck me as well when I heard this. I think first, in terms of a time frame, this certainly sounds subacute. So I might, you know, think about that a little bit differently than I would something that is acute onset. And then when I heard about the swelling, both in the abdomen and in the legs, um, the the kind of three major categories I think of in terms of organ systems are one, the heart, which could be left heart or right heart. 
two, the kidneys, and three, the liver. Um, so just thinking about big organ systems that might be involved. Um, completely agree uh, with Robin on keeping kind of a broad differential for orthopnea. We classically think about congestive heart failure, but there's other things that can cause that, um, including diaphragm paralysis, asthma, obesity. There's a lot of other things that can cause orthopnea. And then the last thing is just, I haven't yet figured out a way to tie in night sweats with these big buckets. When I hear about night sweats, that makes me either think um, about um, malignancy or some sort of inflammatory condition, so a multi-system problem that, that might possibly explain this. So I think the differential is, is still broad and would wanna wait and get a little bit more information. And I'm also intrigued by this medication. Oh, incredible thoughts. Yeah, like every time we see on that question, like this patient started a new medication, you know that the medication is somehow related to the clinical picture. Uh, Mac, could you please carry on? Yeah, so um, I'll kind of, for the next aliquot, I'll go in kind of a different kind of order for it. So I'll start with her social history. So she was raised in Southeast Asia and she moved to uh, Seattle just a few years prior. She does not have a history of tobacco, alcohol, or drug use. Um, she has uh, three children, um, but they're all in their teenage years, and so no recent pregnancies. For her past medical history, she does have um, a history of latent tuberculosis, uh, chronic untreated hepatitis B virus, and then iron deficiency. No past, surgical his, uh, no past surgical history, the medications that we were able to kind of dig up um, when uh, we asked her to um, give us her, um, her medication bottles was tenofovir um, and then also Advil. She has no other known allergies. Um, and then I think the last bit looking at her family history is that her mother um, died in her uh, late 50s of cirrhosis, and that her brother also um, unfortunately died of cancer in his late 20s. Uh, Bashak, this new background information of the patient changes your differential somehow? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some of the organ systems we were thinking of um, may be involved. So there's a family history of liver disease, and she also has untreated hepatitis B. Um, so she's certainly at risk for um, progression to cirrhosis. We don't know yet if she has cirrhosis, but if she did, that could certainly explain some of the swelling. And then hepatitis B is one of the interesting viruses in that it can cause hepatocellular carcinoma even without causing cirrhosis. So I'm um, just thinking again about malignancy. Um, and then Mac, I just wanted to clarify that she um, recently started this medication and that was tenofovir. Do we have a sense of the timeline of the development of her symptoms in relation to starting that medication? Yeah, so her, um, actually her, um, she started tenofovir uh, five weeks prior and then her symptoms began three weeks prior. Okay. Um, so that's certainly a consideration. All uh, drugs can have lots of side effects. Um, and then I will just add again, because we had renal failure in our differential as well, if she was taking a lot of ibuprofen, that could be contributing too. And Mac, you mentioned latent TB. Um, was that ever treated? Um, unfortunately, she doesn't remember if it was, uh, if it was treated. Uh, Robin, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that's a, a great um, summary to start. Certainly the kind of history of some of these more chronic diseases is I think really important for us to understand and continue to work hard at gaining any additional past history. Maybe it will come back to her as we um, continue along in our, in our course here. Thank you. Uh, Mac, could you please carry on? Yeah, so um, for physical exam, uh, she is afebrile. Her blood pressure is 162 over 94. She is tachycardic at 118. Her respirations are 32, and her oxygen saturation is 81% on 10 liters nasal cannula. For the rest of her exam, for her general appearance, she is a very distressed appearing um, woman who is sitting upright in bed, uh, unable to speak uh, more than just a couple words at a, at a time. For H-E-E-N-T, she um, doesn't have any injection. There's no scleral icterus. 
for her cardiovascular exam. She does have a tachycardic, but a regular rate. Um, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. She has two to three plus lower extremity edema, pitting. And then for her respiratory exam, uh, as I'd said before, so her, uh, she's speaking in very short sentences, just two to three words. Her respirations are very labored. You can see a lot of accessory muscle use going on. She has asymmetric and decreased chest expansion on the right. There is dullness to percussion throughout the right thorax, but normal on the left. And then for her auscultation, she has decreased, if not absent, breath sounds uh, on, the, on the right. There, uh, her left lung sounds were clear, um, and then she didn't have any apparent uh, tracheal deviation. For, um, I really tried to like ham up the respiratory exam because I know why. I know we're uh, here at Palm Creek here. You're making uh, me smack. I know, right? <laughs> so <Sweating. exciting. laughs> I know, right? Oh my god. Um, so then, for her abdomen, uh, she has a distended abdomen, um, and she has a positive fluid wave. Um, it's kind of diffusely, mildly tender. Uh, and then her neurologic exam is uh, unremarkable. Very detailed physical exam. Thank you, Mac. Um, Robin, do you have anything to share? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just as I was um, saying somewhat in jest, but in reality, I, I'm very concerned about this very ill woman. Um, she is markedly hypoxemic. Uh, she's working very hard to breathe and obviously has pathology going on in her chest, which we will dive into both in our discussion and I'm certain in other diagnostics uh, to help us better elucidate uh, what's going on there. But, um, you know, she is, she is certainly in distress. And so the, the first thing I'm going to be worried about is securing her airway. Um, and that will be my number one priority before even moving on uh, to the rest of the steps. Uh, Dr. Bashar, um, any other thoughts here? Yeah, I am equally worried. So I think step one, sick, not sick. She's very, very ill. Um, so I completely agree with Robin's assessment on both how sick she is and the priorities in terms of her airway management. And I think, you know, just going back to this history that she has, um, we're, we're going to obviously get more diagnostics, but just hearing that someone who has spent time in an area endemic for TB, who has latent tuberculosis, who's coming in with respiratory symptoms and um, night sweats, this might not be TB at all, but this is someone that I would place in isolation and would, um, would want to rule out uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. And then the other things that just stand out on our exam are mostly just confirming what we thought based on our history, which is that she does have um, edema kind of all over. She has fluid everywhere. It sounds like in her lower extremities, she has the presence of ascites. And then based on the outstanding pulmonary exam um, from Dr. Holmberg, I think she likely has a right pleural effusion. Um, based on our exam findings, we'll of course confirm that with ultrasound. Um, and that could, again, be of hepatic origin. Maybe this is that she has liver disease and ascites, and we're seeing translocation across the diaphragm and a right-sided hepatic hydrothorax, or this could be a completely unrelated condition. Um, so I think after she stabilized, um, important next steps are going to be evaluating what's going on um, in her lungs with some uh, imaging and ultrasound, and then ultimately likely sampling that fluid um, to try to figure out what type of fluid this is that's everywhere in her body. I wonder if you could also clarify like um, the airway precautions that we'll be taking with this patient. Would you consider like high flow nasal cannula, intubate? How do you go in this case? How would you go? I would proceed to intubation for this patient. Um, again, she's very hypoxemic. She's in significant distress. Um, and already working very hard. Um, and it's going to take us time to, to uh, think about what's going on and to be able to potentially provide diagnostics that would um, alleviate her respiratory symptoms, um, you know, to get getting to the bottom of this diagnosis and then treatment is certainly going to take us time and her safety is going to be our number one priority. So proceeding to um, intubation is where I would go. Okay, and then I just want to ask, um, one additional question that came up in the chat that I think is a great one. Um, both Robin and I were concerned about heart failure, and it's going to be really hard to tease out based on what we've heard so far. But I'm curious if there were um, any other, you mentioned no murmurs, Mac. Um, did she have jugular venous distension, a displaced PMI, anything else on exam? Um, so concerned about her heart. 
No displaced PMI. I heard JVP was, I think, uh, probably nine centimeters at 45 degrees. Um, so I think uh, a bit hyper uh, hypervolemic, but not not super rip. Someone uh, asks here if you would you consider BiPAP before proceeding to intubation. I think in this patient, she is already in uh, such extremis um, that I think that we really need to, to take control and do our best to support her in all the ways that we can. Um, I don't think that bi-level would provide uh, sufficient support for her. Yep. Yeah, totally, totally agree. I think we, we often reach for bi-level ventilation because we want to stave off um, something more invasive, um, but really bi-level ventilation is only going to be indicated for a pretty short list of things, um, acute hypercarbic respiratory failure, like a COPD exacerbation, um, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, if we thought this is all just heart failure and we just need a few hours for diuretics to take effect and we'll just support with bi-level at that time. But if whatever is going on is gonna take longer to fix than a few hours, we, we know that we actually do patients harm when we start with bi-level ventilation. So I agree, I think she needs endotracheal intubation. Some, One other um, aspect of that uh, jugular vein distension question that sort of came to my mind, you know, Bishak and I have been talking about um, heart failure and her, her blood pressure is robust in this moment. Maybe that's from her sympathetic drive it being in such extremis, but, you know, we're toying with this idea of tuberculosis and that um, tuberculosis can have involvement in the pericardium. Um, and so that similarly could uh, lead to some of the symptoms she's having, abdominal distension, lower extremity swelling. And so, um, that's just another thing that is sort of coming to mind. And I may, you know, I, I will be doing my own bedside uh, cardiac ultrasound and recruiting uh, trained technologists to facilitate a uh, formal one as well. Um, that's just one other thing that popped into my mind as we're thinking about her cardiac function um, and discussing TB. I think maybe constrictive pericarditis with TB with heart failure. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I actually have another question. We have many medical students here, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the difference between CPAP, BiPAP, you know, and when you use them. Dr. Bashak already talked a little bit about BiPAP. Maybe you could talk a little bit about CPAP as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, CPAP and um, bi-level are methods of non-invasive respiratory support. And CPAP offers a continuous positive pressure. It's delivered uh, to patients through the duration of their respiratory cycle. Um, and so that uh, when we create our settings, there's a number of things we get to select, but importantly, we get to select that one pressure that patients will always receive. Bi-level uh, comes with two pressures among some other settings that provides both an inspiratory pressure and an end expiratory pressure that helps to facilitate ventilation. Um, and so just like Bishak was mentioning, sometimes to help ease work of breathing and improve um, ventilatory support, we try to reach for bi-level, which again provides patients with an inspiratory uh, pressure kind of to facilitate that um, initial ventilation. And then will the lower limit will be that um, end expiratory pressure just like that baseline CPAP pressure. Thank you. And Very one way that I, I, I think about those is that CPAP really just helps you with oxygenation. So if someone has purely hypoxemic respiratory failure, like you might have with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, then CPAP is generally sufficient. But if someone is hypercarbic and they need help with CO2 elimination, then you need to add that second inspiratory pressure. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Mac, could you please carry on? Yeah, so I think we have a handful of things that we uh, have requested, and I think to uh, reflect actually how these instances go in like the ICU setting, I'll give probably the ultrasound findings, the bedside ultrasound findings first. So the bedside cardiac ultrasound um, was notable for, uh, it appeared like a globally normal EF, so a normal ejection fraction. Um, good squeeze. There was no uh, pericardial effusion uh, that was appreciated. Um, for her lung ultrasound, the left was unremarkable, but the right was notable for uh, what it looked to be like free flowing fluid uh, and kind of lung flapping on the ultrasound. Um, and I think those were kind of the uh, major things for the ultrasound. Uh, chest x-ray was obtained very quickly, which was notable for complete opacification of the right hemithorax. 
Um, and I'll kind of just like uh, leave that one there. Uh, then going to her labs for her CBC, she had a white count of 12, an H and H of 10 and 30, and her platelets were 100. And here I'll slow down. Sorry, I'm talking too fast. Yeah, so 10 and 30. Um, and uh, for her chemistries, her sodium was 130, potassium was 4.1, chloride 104, bicarb of 26, uh, BUN creatinine of 19 and 0 0.36, uh, glucose was 108, her calcium, phos, and mag were all normal, her AST was 77, ALT was 78, ALK FOS was 128, uh, T Billy was 2.2. Um, and her, let's see, her total protein was 7.2, albumin was 2.7. So I can uh, stop right there, or I can also give more labs. Uh, Robin and Bashak, did you have things that you wanted to add based off of these initial, um, initial things, or do you want me to give more studies? I guess one question I would have, and you may not have this information because you mentioned she hadn't... Um engaged with healthcare recently, but I would wonder what her baseline values are for her uh, blood counts. Wondering, you know, like 12 is a, a mild leukocytosis that may not blow our socks off in another setting, but if her baseline is four, and this is a big relative jump for her, I'd be curious about that. Uh, and then similarly, uh, her platelets are gonna, I'm thinking about her liver with her platelets and wondering what her baseline is. Is this a big drop for her? Is this just where she hangs out normally? Um, and then, you know, she's a little bit anemic and wondering if that's her baseline lately as well. Yeah, so I think for her uh, baseline, she, um, we were able to dig into the chart. She was last seen like in clinic a couple of years before, I think right uh, after she'd come to the States um, and her H&H uh, &H were stable. Her white count, I think at that time was around like four to six, uh, but nothing uh, else really stood out. There is a piece of information that um, there was one imaging finding which was done, which is a, um, an abdominal ultrasound from two years before, which had shown coarse hepatic parenchyma. Um, and then she had the, uh, she had a Q gold, which was positive. Um, and then I think, um, yeah, I think those were kind of the other uh, baseline stuff that we had access to. So my thoughts, just hearing the story, um, you know, we, we started with the ultrasound, but I think when we see complete opacification of a hemithorax, there's like, there's three things on your differential. Either there's a massive pleural effusion um, where you might expect kind of the trachea to be deviated away from that side, or there's complete lung collapse, or the person has had a pneumonectomy on that side and they don't have a lung. Um, and based on what we're hearing on the ultrasound findings, it sounds like this is a very large um, pleural effusion. And I think it's just a good take home point. We always talk about the tracheal deviation, but Mac, you mentioned she didn't have that on exam and that's not always present even when you do have a very large effusion. And then the things that stand out to me from her labs are just that her renal function actually looks good. That was one of the organs we were worried about. Um, and that her, um, her uh, anion gap is zero, which I've seen a low anion, anion gap, but I don't know if I've ever seen one of zero unless I'm doing math wrong in my head. I'm gonna look to the rest of folks. Um, so that, that stood, stood out to me while, while everyone is doing some math. And then <clears throat> her liver function, um, uh, she does seem to have a, a protein gap. So normally I would expect the total protein to be about twice that of the albumin, and this is a little bit higher. So, um, you know, you can see that in myeloma and other kind of paraproteinemias. Um, and then I would love to know her INR um, to get a sense of what her liver synthetic function is. Yeah, so INR is 1.5. Uh, and then for some other labs too, BNP of 128, troponin um, uh, was negative, her lactate was 2.3, and then I actually don't have any more uh, labs. I have uh, some specialty labs if we wanted to talk about fluid studies. 
I'll add just because Bishak made the point that um, HIV can contribute to a protein gap as well. I don't know if she's had any kind of routine um, health maintenance screenings outside of um, that one clinic visit a couple years ago, but that's just uh, something else that comes to mind when I see a protein gap. At this point, Dr. Bashak, um, what would you be most interested in terms of management for this patient, like in terms of diagnostic tests, what would you be doing in that position? Yeah, so I think we've done the most important thing, which is securing her airway. Um, and hopefully that has um, taken away some of her distress and um, you know, we'll want to know from Mac how she's doing clinically at this point. It is not uncommon when people are in distress for them to be tachycardic and hypertensive because they have this huge sympathetic drive in the setting of you know, the respiratory distress that they're in. And it's not uncommon that after um, receiving neuromuscular blockade and being intubated, people can become profoundly hypotensive. So um, one, I would wanna know how she's doing clinically in that regard. Um, and then in terms of management, I think um, we need to do some more digging. Um, and I think she has fluid in kind of two different spaces um, that needs to be sampled for us to figure out why ascites is present and why this pleural effusion is present. Um, I think we probably, it just depends on how she's doing clinically. I think you could go after either one. You might start with the, uh, uh, a paracentesis and sample that fluid first. And my goal would be to try to figure out it, is there um, a high SAG, a serum ascites to albumin gradient that would make me think more about uh, portal hypertension as a cause for the ascites, um, or is there a low SAG that might go along with um, all the other causes of, of ascites? So that might be the first place that I would start. Uh, any other thoughts, Robin? Yeah, that sounds um, like a great plan. Eventually we'll get to attempting to sample her pleural fluid as well. And then similarly trying to dive into whether this is a transudative or an exudative fluid, which could also give us uh, a clue as to the primary driver of the fluid accumulation. What about the hypertension? Does this like ring a bell? Um, maybe this patient has previous hypertension, it doesn't know. How do you deal with this piece of information? I think Bashak made a great point earlier about, um, she mentioned a lot of NSAID use, wondering if it was impacting her kidneys, but a lot of NSAID use could similarly impact her blood pressure. Um, and so we can get to that a little, a little bit from, from Mac. Um, and also, you know, what is her, her baseline blood pressure, but, uh, having stood at the bedside, uh, in many situations where people be, are hypertensive, get intubated, and then become profoundly hypotensive. I certainly share in Bashak's worry uh, about a, a significant clinical change. Yeah, so how about I give an update about, uh, or after um, intubation and securing of airway happens. So we're uh, still, is still afebrile. Blood pressure um, uh, drops down to 110 over uh, like 73. Her heart rate is uh, is now in the upper 90s, so we can just say 98 for the for the form. Uh, her we have now set her respiratory rate, um, but she uh, she's only over breathing the vent a little bit. She's around uh, 22, and then her oxygen saturation um, is 95% uh, with an FiO2. I think the initial FiO2, just because like she was put in, in put on an intubated was I think um, uh, 80 or 90 percent, uh, but now she's she is uh, saturating well. I think other um, other things jumping into the pleural fluids or the pleural and the pair and the abdominal fluid studies. So for her um, ascites fluid, um, uh, she did have a high SAG. Um, uh, I don't have the specific numbers with me, but her SAG was high. Um, and then for her pleural fluid studies, I can list these out. So the glucose was 120, the LDH was 110, the protein was 1.5, and the albumin was less than one. And then for her serum studies, which we need to, um, to also have would be her serum LDH was 620, and then her serum protein, as we have, is uh, 7.2. Rashak, what comes in mind with this new piece of information? Yeah, so I think um, 
I think hemodynamically she's doing fine. I think this suggests to me that she was hypertensive because she was in profound respiratory distress and likely just had complete collapse of her right lung. And now that we've hopefully aerated some of that lung, now that she's um, being mechanically ventilated, um, she seems to be doing okay hemodynamically. Um, in terms of her acidic fluid, um, so again, hearing it's high SAG, this is going to make me think more that the, this is um, due to portal hypertension, and it sounds like there's maybe some suggestion of that from the abdominal ultrasound. Um, so cer certainly she could have cirrhosis related to um, her underlying untreated hep uh, hepatitis B. Um, the other thing I would wonder about is whether um, I would send a cell count and differential off of that. Um, wondering if she uh, potentially has an infected um, uh, acidic fluid and does she have um, spontaneous bacterial uh, peritonitis? So we'd wanna know a little bit more studies there. Um, and then I think her pleural fluid um, looks relatively, oh, I'm, and I just wanna make sure that I'm right on this. I think the, that protein was from the acidic fluid. Is that right, Mac? The protein of one, the, so uh, LDH of 110 and protein of 1.5 for uh, the pleural fluid. Oh, okay. All right. So um, I would interpret that then as, so her um, pleural fluid to serum LDH is less than 0 0.6 and her pleural fluid to serum total protein is less than 0 0.5 and her pleural fluid LDH is less than two thirds of normal for the serum. Um, so all of those criteria would fit that this is a transudative fluid, which again would fit with this is just translocation from um, her ascites. Again, I would uh, send a cell count and differential on that as well. You can also get a condition called spontaneous bacterial empyema, where the um, pleural space gets infected for reasons that are unclear to me. It has slightly different diagnostic criteria. Um, rather than 250 cells in the acidic fluid, you need 500 in the pleural fluid. Um, but again, we wanna make sure that that's not infected. And so far, I think this is all suggesting that this is decompensated liver disease that's leading to um, her abdominal distension, her lower extremity edema. Mac, do you know if she's ever had SVP before? Uh, no, she, is, she doesn't have a history of SVP. Okay. And do you have the um, specific studies yeah, so cell cell count for her was uh, two hundred. So for her ascites or acidic fluid, uh, the cell count was two hundred with like ninety percent uh, neutrophils. Um, uh, and then for I actually don't think I have the cell count for her pleural fluid studies. Um, uh, but then I have some other uh, studies for things looking at it. Probably some things that you're thinking about. So we did get. Uh, uh, bacterial, fungal, and um, acid fast bacilli cultures on the fluid, and those were all uh, negative. The um, AFB PCR was also negative. Um, and let's see, her alpha feta protein was 110. Um, and then I think, yeah, I think that's the majority of uh, the objective data that I have for her. Great. The, um, the reason I was asking actually is because, you know, if someone has had SBP before or, um, and I'll be honest that I have to look up what the specific number is, but there are markers of people's ascites fluid that if, uh, if they meet, meet certain levels actually are lower than, and I believe it's the protein is lower than one, Bashak will correct me, one and a half, something like that. Um, that necessitates SBP prophylaxis going forward. And so that's actually what I was curious about, um, wondering if, if she should have been on that and wasn't before or, or something like that. And now, and now that you have like the, the, all the fluids studies on you, what would you go next in terms of management for this patient? Well, I'm wondering, um, Mac, maybe you can tell us, you know, that fluid accumulation was undoubtedly, both in her abdomen and in her pleural space was undoubtedly contributing to her respiratory distress. And so I am curious about um, the volume of fluid that was removed and the way that that has changed um, her hemodynamics and how that's impacted her oxygenation and even her, her labs as well. You know, large fluid shifts may have compromised her renal function to some degree moving forward. I'm just kind of thinking a couple steps ahead. Um, and so those are questions that I would have for you. 
Yeah, um, I think that's the next, uh, definitely the uh, kind of next logical step to see how she did. So she um, removed one and a half liters from her right thorax uh, for her uh, thoracentesis. Um, and her FiO2 requirement went uh, down to 21%, so down to no extra oxygen requirement. She actually was extubated a few hours after that. Um, and then uh, there um, actually just did a diagnostic tap of her paras uh, diagnostic paracentesis. So there was not additional fluid removed from her um, for her abdomen during the kind of initial, initial step. Okay, great. That's really helpful because having more opportunity to speak to our patient and learn more about her in a state when she isn't in total extremis is I am hoping going to be helpful as well as we move forward. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the only other things I'm thinking about, so again, I think um, given that she has latent TB and some systemic symptoms, I, I don't want to take that off of our list, but TB should cause a uh, acidic fluid that has a low serum to ascites albumin gradient. So that is making that a little bit less likely for me. And similarly, if that this was TB pleuritis, I would expect it to be an, a lymphocytic exudative pleural effusion. We're hearing it's transudative. So I would say HIV is dropping a little bit lower on my list. Um, I am curious as to why she has decompensated liver disease though. Um, you know, we know she has underlying hepatitis B, but could she have had some new insult? Does she have portal venous thrombosis or some other reason that she could have um, developed decompensated liver disease. So I agree with Robin. I think we need to talk with her and get a little bit more information and history if we can. And she is a young woman. So as we're thinking very broadly about the liver, autoimmune conditions, um, uh, you know, other medications, again, herbal stuff that she could be taking. Um, there's a, a host of other things um, that, that could be contributing there. Yeah, would you like to, how about I give kind of like her perspective of now she was extubated and kind of hearing how things are. So um, unfortunately she, when she, after she moved to the States, uh, um, just uh, unfortunately in the United States, I think a lot of, there are so many different barriers to healthcare. She had had an initial visit with, um, with a physician um, when she came, I think to International Medicine Clinic that we have at at Harborview, but then I, uh, after that, I think with transportation, being able to take time off from work with her family, had been unable to really follow up with um, any physician, um, and so she didn't receive treatment or anything until recently, and the reason she went in um, uh, five or so weeks before was because she just kind of like started feeling kind of more swollen and not feeling well. Um, and that's when the outpatient providers felt that she was um, starting to develop, you know, volume overload. And that's why they tried to concurrently treat her hepatitis B while also working on her volume. So the, that's kind of like the extra bit of history now that we, um, now that she's able to speak more than two words at a time. That's really helpful, Mac. I think um, someone put in a great comment into the chat about um, what's normal for AFP. And I believe that that is an elevated AFP, but Mac, I'm gonna look to you to correct us. I believe it was red. It was red, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, again, AF, AFP would make us think about have had a cellular carcinoma, which we said can happen you know, with cirrhosis or even before the development of cirrhosis. And maybe you know, that could explain some of the B symptoms and the night sweats that she's reporting. Um, so that's certainly something we would want to evaluate for, and we could do that with um, uh, imaging um, as, uh, for face CT or an MRI and get some additional information there. And then I completely agree with Robin. Um, she's a young woman. We, we know she's had some pregnancies before, but again, she we should look for clot. Um, so I, I would want to write up a quadrant ultrasound and a duplex specifically, um, and then completely agree about looking for things like autoimmune disease, which um, could also potentially explain things like night sweats. And Mac, is she by chance on any OCPs? She's not current, uh, currently on any OCPs. Um, looking at the studies that Bashak was wondering about, vascular imaging um, was, re, uh, was obtained while she was on the inpatient side. So she didn't have any um, PVTs or any large clots uh, that I think were leading to her decompensation. And there were no apparent masses um, on ultrasound for her. 
So someone asked on the question, uh, the chat, like with the LBD, be, could this be, or could this viral hypertension be from a new hepatocellular cellular carcinoma in the setting of Hep B? Absolutely, Alex. Definitely. <laughs> um, I, I agree. We, you know, I, I don't think her INR is quite normal. The, the fact that it is 1.5, it's not as abnormal as, as we might think for decompensated liver disease, but I think she's, she does have synthetic dysfunction. Um, and we haven't heard about other stigmata of, of portal hypertension, um, but I think malignancy is absolutely possible. And that could have been the thing that, that tipped her over. So it would make sense to pursue that as a next step. Um, Mac, I'm, I'm rereading the family history, and you told us that our patient's mother died of cirrhosis and brother of cancer. Do you know the driver of said cirrhosis and the type of cancer? Yeah, I think once we were able to speak with her more, it sounds like a lot of her family had chronic hepatitis okay. B, um, and her brother actually died of liver cancer, um, and her mother uh, cirrhosis, presumably from hepatitis B. Okay, thanks. So what would you go uh, what, where would you go next, Robin? Yeah, so I think at this point, um, it sounds like we've gotten the immediate results from all of our uh, taps thus far, but we probably have some of these autoimmune studies that are still pending. Um, I would be involving our hepatology colleagues as well. Um, really appreciate their input as far as other diagnostics right now. Um, I think we've talked about as far as imaging uh, just an ultrasound, but Bashak did raise the point that there are other modalities that can be helpful. Um, and so asking ourselves, is there another imaging study that we ought to pursue? Um, sending off some of those autoimmune studies that will take a little while to come back, um, awaiting any kind of surprise results on the fluid that's been tapped thus far um, are, I think, probably where I'd be starting for right now. Incredible. Thank you. Bashak, anything else to add? No, nothing else to add. I, I, I do think it would be helpful to add um, cytology to her acidic fluid as well. I don't actually know um, if this is hepatocellular carcinoma, um, how often that would show up on um, acidic fluid cytology, but I, I would send that test and then um, non-invasively, like we talked about, we could do some more imaging to, to better characterize what's going on in our liver. Thank you. Um, Mac? Do you have this piece of information? Uh, no, but I can, uh, I, can, I can answer it as if I did. Um, uh, the cytology, uh, I think these were, these were all big concerns that we had as well. So we did all of these things. Her autoimmune uh, panel came back uh, unremarkable. Um, and then her, her, her cytology for her acidic fluid um, came back with no abnormal cells. Um, the cytology also for the pleural fluid, which was sent, also came back with no abnormal cells. Um, and, I, and then I think we talked about, yeah, the ultrasound and then also CT imaging didn't show any vascular anomalies. Um, no, I think like obvious concerns, I think for hepatocellular carcinoma or masses within her liver, but it was something that we were really, uh, really conscious of because of the, her um, AFP and then also her family history and everything that happening. So Bashak, where would you go next here? Where were you thinking? Oof, okay. So um, let me ask this, Max. So at this point you said the imaging and certainly the cytology is not suggestive of malignancy. Um, have we confirmed that she has cirrhosis? Yeah, so we, we did not do um, the fiber scan on the inpatient side, but a repeat uh, ultrasound did show very coarse appearing um, liver parenchyma. And based off of what you guys wanted, hepatology felt that based off her prior imaging and then her current like presentation that she did have um, uh, clinical cirrhosis without the definitive fiber scan. Okay. So we do think she has cirrhosis, but there are still some unexplained things. And I would say the things in my mind that are still unexplained for her are, why is she having night sweats, number one, because I would not expect cirrhosis to cause that. Um, two, why does she have an elevated AFP? So we think about that with hepatocellular carcinoma and we could tie that in again with liver cancer, but there are other malignancies that can um, uh, elevate AFP as well. So. Do we have a sense of whether we have imaging of her ovaries and how, how do things look elsewhere in her abdomen and pelvis? 
Yeah, so um, there was no apparent in her lung parenchyma, there was no um, obvious like cancers or masses. Uh, she didn't have any uh, lymphadenopathy, which was appearing on her imaging for her GU. Um, she didn't have any masses around her ovaries, no, um, I think, uh, kind of increased lining within her uterus. She had not been able to have her pap smear done um, in a uh, uh, since she'd been, um, since she'd arrived. Um, and then there were no other kind of, I think, concerns for, uh, for malignancy uh, that we saw on her initial set of imaging. I don't mean to keep throwing negative, like negative imaging findings and stuff at you. I just, yeah. So what's going on in your mind, uh, Robin, right now? Yeah, I'm also feeling a little perplexed right now. So what I'm hearing is, um, you know, a woman who has cirrhosis uh, came in acutely decompensated, but we're really struggling to identify what the driver of that was. And, um, you know, one simple contributor could be, I think, Mac, you said that she had a pretty coarse appearing liver several years prior. And so one very simple, at least contributor to what's going on is just untreated uh, or inadequately treated um, cirrhosis up until this point. And again, this is a at least subacute maybe even chronic um, accumulation of, of fluid. And perhaps, you know, she was, she was needing a more aggressive management in the preceding weeks to months um, that she wasn't getting. And so perhaps that was playing a part of what's going on. But to Bashak's point again, you know, certainly doesn't explain her night sweats um, and some of the other lab derangements that are, that are going on right now. And then since Robin and I talked about how much we love the team sport of critical care, I love that we have people who are helping us out in the chat. And um, again, going back to this large protein gap um, and this non-existent, very low anion gap and thinking again about um, HIV, um, myeloma, doing some more evaluation in, in that regard in terms of getting an SPEP and a UPEP and um, getting some additional studies to try to sort that out. I can't in my mind, necessarily tie that in with an elevated AFP, but that seems like a very reasonable next step. Um, I don't have uh, her SPEP, um, uh, but I will say that it was normal. And do, any chance do you have a pregnancy test? Someone asked us on the chat. And she, yeah, and she was, that's actually a really good question. She was, um, she was not pregnant. Uh, and someone also asked, can you do all the tenofovir? So I don't know. I, when I think about, you know, side effects of tenofovir, you know, renal failure is the big one that comes to mind. Um, and, you know, we use tenofovir to treat hepatitis B. So I, uh, I don't know that it would necessarily lead to decompensated liver disease, but I don't know. It's not a drug that I prescribe very commonly. So I think that's a great idea to, to look into that. Certainly temporally, she describes that she started this medication and then two weeks later, she abruptly got worse. Um, so doing a, a really good look to see what could be going on with the drug seems like a next step. Yeah, and I think that was a question that we also had for hepatology. I think that was our big concern because we were just trying to figure out what, like, what, what you two were doing, like, what was the reason for her decompensation? Was this really a um, kind of a subacute on chronic um, worsening of her volume overload and cirrhosis that was untreated based off of a lot of, I think, social barriers um, to getting the care that she needed? Or was it um, a new clot, was it the medication? Um, and we did a pretty deep dive, I think, into like PubMed and talked with hepatology and they felt pretty confident that it was not gonna be the tenofovir that uh, precipitated um, like this very, very large uh, right pleural effusion. Um, uh, and I don't think there were any case reports that we were able to find. Mac, now that that one and a half liters of uh, pleural fluid was removed, and I imagine, and you mentioned not a therapeutic para, so perhaps I can invoke not enough ascites fluid to make her incredibly uncomfortable or um, uh, to be, you know, obstructing her lung mechanics or something like that. I'm wondering if that fluid reaccumulated very quickly, if at all. Um, you know, is her abdomen growing? Is that fluid coming back up in her pleural space? Just to get a sense of um, 
yeah. you know, what what's what that is. So like. actually, what happened is so uh, initially the thoracentesis was done because I think they were they were trying to prioritize her hypoxemic respiratory failure uh, to give some uh, relief and uh, allow her lungs to engage in gas exchange, um, and they only did the diagnostic para and pretty quickly after that found that she was feeling more short of breath and that her pleural fluid had reaccumulated pretty quickly. Um, and so I think that kind of like hones into, I think what you guys are thinking about of like, what is the ultimate kind of like treatment for like this, this fluid um, and is taking, I think taking out one side, you know, just like lead to a reaccumulation or if is, is it just gonna, um, or are we gonna find a definitive solution? And I should ask, you know, it has reaccumulated in the face of having initiated some management. So it was some volume removal mechanism like diuresis initiated as well. Are we sort of yeah. through overcoming her, that? Yeah, so throughout her hospitalization, so there was the initial kind of thora and diagnostic para, reaccumulation, and then a re repeat thora. Um, and then kind of concurrently going with that, there was pretty aggressive volume uh, or volume management and diuresis. And as uh, she lost a bunch of weight and her peripheral mm -hmm. edema uh, resolved uh, um, and her distension, her acidic fluid uh, went away, they found that her pleural fusions uh, did not reaccumulate. So incredible. Uh, Mac, just for the sake of time, could you give us like all the information that you have? and maybe best track and where we can get, can have like an educated guess to what's going on. I have definitely given you all of the information that I have. <laughs> I don't have, I have a picture of the chest X-ray if, if you wanted to see it, but I, I like, I, I really have, I think I've given all the information that I have. No, no problem, thank you. Uh, Bashak, Robin, before uh, Mike revealing the pattern diagnosis, do you have any educated guess, something that you wanna share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I would say is, um, first off, I'm glad she's doing better. It sounds like um, we have have figured out that she has decompensated liver disease. And based on the information that we have so far, we think that it's probably related to untreated hepatitis B. Um, she has a hepatic hydrothorax um, and has improved with starting diuretic. So we know at least from the volume overload standpoint that she's doing better. Um, knowing that she has decompensated liver disease, in any patient, we would want to screen for HCC. We've done that for her, and it looks like we've exhaustively looked for malignancy in her and, and have not found it. Um, and then I, I guess I'm still left with um, why it is that she you know, has some systemic signs and this elevated AFP, and I think you're just going to have to reveal that for us because I'm perplexed. Um. I, uh, I, unfortunately, they, um, they actually didn't fit into any kind of clinical uh, syndrome for it. And so that I'm not, I'm not kind of hiding something behind our curtain for, for you guys for that. Um, um, and I think she's been engaging in outpatient care to uh, just kind of continue monitoring because I think hepatology is making sure that uh, uh, the alpha feeder protein isn't going to be reflective of uh, an HCC that pops up at another point. That was right in line with their thinking. Oh, incredible. Thank you, Mike, for presenting this case. Um, Robin, Bashak, before we moving on to teaching points, uh, do you want to share something like um, something that we should take away from this case? I think, um, you know, this case really highlights, um, it really highlights an appreciation and respect for the many barriers that, that are present in our world as far as receiving routine care, healthcare maintenance, um, and staying up to date on even known medical problems, let alone new medical problems. Um, it is heartbreaking that it took really this extreme decompensation and the severity of her symptoms um, to enable her to re-engage with us and to, to get care again. And so um, I know all of us, each and every one of us will be uh, working toward um, improving our system and trying to make care more accessible to others. But I think this case really highlights, uh, highlights that point. Incredible insight. Thank you for sharing. Oh, Bashak? A hundred percent. I mean, I just want to amplify everything that, that Robin said. I, that is what stands out to me. This is a, a young woman with um, a condition that we could have anticipated. Um, she has 
hepatitis B, which we know leads um, untreated, can lead to cirrhosis, lead to malignancy. Um, and I think this very much does reflect a, a failure of our healthcare system that this resulted in an ICU admission and critical illness for this patient for her to get diagnosed with something that you know, hopefully could have been prevented entirely. Uh, I just want to thank you, Bashak, Rowling, and Mac for coming. It was such an educational session. We learned so much from you all, and thank you very much. Um, and to finish us off, maybe Deborah, can you share your teaching points? Hello, everyone. It was a really good discussion and case. Thank you for being with us on this Monday. And going for the teaching points, uh, at first, we're going to look for their head flags, like palpitation, swelling, if the patient take medication, supplement, and look for the time. Um, because if, in this case, like could be super acute, that can get more uh, intense. And the differential diagnosis could be heart failure, a vascular complication, a thyroid, um, a TB. And then we thought about the liver that because of the risk of cirrhosis from hepatitis B that can cause the hep hepatocellular carcinoma, plus that the patient had the history of the cancer with the family. And the intubation in this case was, was indicated because of the hypoxemia and the diagnosis could take some time. And the hypertension that the patient presented can be um, from the respiratory distress. And then after the intubation, the patient can present the hypertension. And we had a, a good differentiation about CPAP and BPAP that the CPAP, it's non-invasive respiratory device and continuous peak that helps with the oxygenation. And the BPAP is suppression, respiratory and end respiratory pressure and helps with the CO2 eliminations. And the high AFP can be from the pathocellular carcinoma that can explain the B symptoms, the germ cell tumors, and then that should be between 10 and 20, the value. And the protein gap, the, we thought about the HIV, toxocariasis, the myeloma, and paraproteinemia. And that's it. So thank you, everyone. It was a great case. I hope to see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you.